This is part one of a two-part podcast with Baroness Helena Kennedy. She was so funny, so fascinating, that we couldn't edit it down, so we decided to have a two-parter. Sit back and enjoy Baroness Helena Kennedy, part one. The judge is reading this out, how to make a Molotov cocktail. And he says, is this the sort of book that you have on your coffee table to me? And I said, but my Lord, it's a bit like having the Kama Sutra. The fact that you've got it doesn't mean that you do all the things. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humor with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a renowned barrister and member of the House of Lords. She's built a career on showing compassion in the courtroom. As a member of the House of Lords, she has fought endlessly for women's rights and against misogyny. She has served as the chair for Charter 88, the Human Genetics Commission, the Power Inquiry and the British Council. She has played a hand in the country's biggest cases, from the Brighton bombing to the Guildford Four appeal. When she's not advocating for equality and fighting for freedoms, you can find her captivating crowds on stage, on the screen and over the airways as a presenter for programmes like Heart of the Matter, Time Gentlemen Please and Blind Justice. She is truly a champion of social justice who leads with passion, wit and humanity. Baroness Helena Kennedy, welcome to the Humorology podcast. It's lovely to be here, Paul. Well, it's it's such a pleasure to see you, and I'm a huge fan of your work. Firstly, I'd like to take you back to the early years when you were growing up in a tenement uh, in the impoverished south side of Glasgow. Now, as you may know, I know Glasgow well, as my mother's side of the family are from Brigton. And Glaswegians are renowned for their caustic wit. Was humour valued in your family? Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, and it's so interesting, that business about being brought up in the south side of Glasgow. Um, you you were never allowed to get too big for your boots. And so part of the humour was about sort of cutting people down to, down to size. Um, uh, but uh, I also had an uh, uncle who was an entertainer. And uh, he was, uh, he was, um, uh, it's hard to explain just how, uh, how this was. He, his name was Jack Connolly. He was actually otherwise known as Jakey Connolly. And he had, his family had at one stage for quite a short time gone to Canada on one of those things where you could go on for, you know, very little money um, because they were wanting migrants to settle in, um, in Australia or Canada. And he and his family had gone to Canada and then, and not much liked it, and found it pretty hard going. But it was they were right out in the in the far west of Canada, and uh, and he certainly uh, learned to ride. Um, and it was farmland, and these were folk who had, knew nothing about farming, I can tell you. So <laughs> they came back to Glasgow, and my uncle Jack, um, I used to. My first memory is as a child was that when it was the May Day Parade in Glasgow, was that my Uncle Jack was on a white horse wearing a Stetson and basically being like Roy Rogers. He used to lead the, the, this parade <laughs> and, and he used to sing um, sort of uh, cowboy songs. And he was known as, and he used to affect an American, a kind of American and North American accent, let's, let's put it that way. And, uh, and then, of course, when he was at home, he was as Glaswegian as the rest of us. Um, but uh, he was a great uh, comic and, uh, and a source of great laughter in our wider family. So there was sort of a, a showbiz show off gene already running through the family was that he certainly he was he actually was a, had a very nice singing voice and he uh, ended up having a band and he would play everybody uh, everybody on the south side we were the catholic community of the south side and he used to play everybody's weddings 
and uh, and events and uh, uh, anniversary parties and all that sort of thing. And his daughters all could sing. Our side of the family, we we, we were all very, very close. Um, and there were four girls in their family and four girls in ours. And our four girls, we couldn't, we weren't very uh, talented on the musical front at all. Um, but I do think that my, uh, that, we, we certainly loved the fact that we had this entertainer in our, in our midst. And he was very, very funny. And, uh, and my aunt and he had a sort of, were a double act where eventually he became a magician. And, uh, and he used to do that thing where he'd take a half a crown from behind your ear or he would uh, take things out of his sleeves. And in Glasgow, of course, you had to, you'd have to be really good to be able to do that because he would do it at schools and things when he was old. And the kids would shout out, I can see, mister, where you put that, <laughs> put that handkerchief. And uh, he would get very cross with his audience. But he was, he was a great source of fun. And so I think the idea that you could, you could deal with tough things by being um, funny was something I learned early on. And, and my mother was very witty and funny. And, uh, and, uh, and so I, I learned that you can use humor even when things are quite dark and, and when things are bleak. And oh, you've just talked about us being brought up in the south side of Glasgow in a tenement and so on. We, we were, I only was able in retrospect to look back and see that we were, pretty hard up but you know when you're in the midst when when you when you live amongst people who are all this in the same in the same boat you don't think of yourself as being poor um and one of my sisters said recently to me when I was uh, you know I'd been interviewed or something she said why do you have to tell people we were poor and I said well, it's just the reality but there's no shame in, in the fact that we weren't well off and my mother took great pride in the fact that she turned us out well and uh, I once went back um uh, to, to, to her house after I'd been interviewed in Scotland at, at the BBC and uh, the man who was then and became the sort of commission or one of the sort of um, main folk in the BBC was a man called James Boyle and he was he'd gone to the same school as me and uh, I and uh, I went home and I said I saw James Boyle and he's now the head of the BBC and, and whatever and I said and he, he said that his mother used to always say those Kennedy girls are always so well turned out and you know that my mother, forget about being a barrister, my mother thought that was the best thing that she'd ever heard about herself. You know, the fact that her girls were so well turned out, although, we, you know, it took a lot of hard work for her to take up hems and uh, mend clothes and, uh, and buy things second hand in order to turn us out well. <laughs> It, it was a matter of pride, wasn't it? Because um, my family were the same, that you had to, with your the little, little you had, you had to show that uh, you knew how to dress properly. We had a friend called Kim Kinney, who also uh, grew up about a mile away um, uh, from the, in the East End of Glasgow. And he used to run the comedy store. And he was a wee man. I don't know if you ever met Kim, but a, a force of nature and a very funny man. And he ran the comedy store. He always turned out beautifully. And it was just, and it was kind of like your answer to the world was you turned out beautifully, but you also used humour to even the playing field, do you think? Um, there is a strong Scottish thing, which is, um, is, it is quite egalitarian. I don't know what that's about. I suspect that maybe um, Presbyterianism, you know, we're, we're all Jock Thompson's bairns and uh, that nobody was to be uh, any better than anybody else. It was part, was part of the culture. And, um, and I remember my mother, and it's something that stayed with me all my life, especially when I went to the bar, um, was that, um, that she used to say, you know, never ever think you're better than anybody else, you know, that you didn't have, look down on people. But, but she also said, and nobody's better than you. And we were brought up to feel that, that nobody was better than us. And so when I went down to study law in, the, in London um, and, and then went to the bar, the bar was a, has been, and, and it's only now that it's somewhat opening up, really, uh, and thank goodness for it. But, but um, at, at that time, the percentage of women who were going into the profession was something like five percent it was very very low um, I mean there, there were hardly any women in my classes at all um, and um, and then going into practice it was really low again and um, you know women's it was it was just not it was not the, the thing that ha happened in, in, for women and uh, and certainly to be a working class 
woman, a woman, a girl who came from a working class background. That made, that made me particularly rare. And so um, it was, uh, humour was a way of, of dealing with all of that, you know. And I think that people often, when they're slightly an outsider, they can make themselves, you know, um, belong, I think, by, by being fun. And, and, uh, and I think I learned that. And I think Glaswegians are very good at doing that. Well, I mean, one of my close um, girlfriends in Scotland is Elaine C. Smith, who's a, who's a, a oh, real great... Very funny, great funny comic, yeah, comic actress. And she's very good at, at, at talking about that thing, about how one can use humour um, um, to sort of soften difficult circumstances. And, and I've always used, tried to introduce humour into my public speaking and into my uh, work in the courts. Um, and, uh, and I've never, ever tried to lose my Scottish accent. I always felt that it, it helped in, in making a sort of bridge for example, with juries, um, that uh, you, you're not talking down to people, that you're actually communicating, you know, in a, in a way that is, uh, has no um, grandeur about it and where nobody's being patronised. And so I, I, I made my style of advocacy very different from what was the commonplace at that time in the 70s when I became a barrister, which was all terribly grand and war. Uh, and, uh, and there was a sort of thing where you know suddenly in the midst of this here was this woman with a you know a, a Scots accent and who was from Glasgow <laughs> and uh, I do remember I went at one stage when I was uh, I, I my practice um developed quite fast and I used to I mean I used to joke and say that um every Scot that got arrested you know solicitors would say why don't we get that woman <laughs> <laughs> she'll be able to translate and uh, and so I, I had I, I in the early days of lots of Scots clients and then it expanded where I had then the whole of the Celtic fringes you know I and I did lots of Irish cases and you mentioned I did some of the cases associated with the Irish troubles or some I, I did a lot of those big Irish cases but I always remember one of the judges saying ah Miss Kennedy when you say murder it sounds as though you had more that there were more than one dead body <laughs> and so I, I I used to think that uh, sometimes it was an advantage for my clients and sometimes perhaps it wasn't but by and large I think that my work in the courts was helped by being a Scot and also by being somebody who was prepared to you know find a, a, a form of, of um of discourse that, that included humour. That's really interesting. And I like it. I mean, but we talked about the south side of Glasgow, but that's a long way from the House of Lords and the barristers' chambers where you spend your time to, uh, today. Are there any parallels between how the humour works in those two vastly different worlds? You'll know this yourself. There's, there, are different, um, there are different ways of being funny. For me, it's always been much more about... Um, uh, I mean, I'm reasonably quick witted, but I but I always find the more interesting thing is to weave it into a story. Um, and so that that is st good storytelling. And that's what that's what advocacy is about. That's what being a barrister is about, because it's really about telling your clients, giving your clients account, telling your clients story in the most compelling way possible. Um, and often it's about. I, you know, I, I quite like to use imagery to do that. And it's a bit like um, the prosecution will come and they will present their case. And I've often said to a jury, you know, sometimes it's a bit like the, 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 what happens in a, in a, in a theatre where the spotlight might be on what's happening on the stage and you, you, that's all that you see. You don't see what's happening around it. But you have to sort of then a moment could come where the whole stage is lit up and you see that beyond that area where the spotlight is other things are going on and that gives you a truer picture and I, and you have to the, the defense lawyers and I'm a defense lawyer the the defense lawyer's role is to really shift the the the, the perspective and to say let's look at it in a different way and 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 then you present it in a a way that is going to be most compelling and most perhaps um, hopefully um, uh, uh, helpful to your client. One of the, 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 the things about advocacy is that you, you really have to leaven it um, because if you're dealing with very serious stuff, there has to be ways in which you can, you can, you can somehow bring relief into it. And I, I, you know, I know this from, um, it's hard to find humor in things like, for example, 
violence against women and girls, you know, I mean, and I do a lot, a lot of my works around that kind of thing. Or the, I mean, nowadays a lot of my work is international and, and I'm looking at really grievous and terrible crimes, which are not just, I mean, crime of any kind can be terrible, but when it's on a horrible, a large scale, then, you know, it's, it's, it's particularly um, uh, depressing and terrible and, and, and affecting. And so how do you, how can you possibly be funny about some of this stuff? And the truth is that I always found it best to be funny about the judges, about judges, you know, and to tell judge stories. Or, um, um, of course, the House of Lords has given me a lot of material. <laughs> 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 Because, of course, it is such a peculiar, you know, institution in many ways. And so you find ways around, you know, when I want to talk to an audience about something serious like violence um, against women and, you know, or whatever it is, um, I, you, you have to find the humour not in the thing that, it, that is the central core of what you're talking about, but around the edges of it. Um, and, and that is necessary in order to in order to somehow leaven the full horror. And it doesn't diminish the horror. Um, in fact, sometimes it can heighten it. What humour does in that sense, and I, I really like your stuff because I think all the best, best humorists are, are storytellers. I also happen to think that all the best communicators are great storytellers. Um, and it's about that um, unique ability to connect with everyone from the accused to the judge, from the, the cabbie to the lord, which you were just talking about. And, and how important it is being kind and compassionate as well as humorous in order to make that work. The comedy that I always prefer is where you can get a sense that someone is not doing it out of cruelty. Um, you know, that the, I mean, I mean you, you, Paul, are, uh, you, you know, are, are a great humorous, uh, uh, humorist. Um, but there's, the, and, and I never ever, I, I feel the, the warmth that there is in you as a person. And I think people engage with that. They recognize that um, in, a, in, in a person. I think it's, I think cruel humor is, 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 is for me, it's unappealing. That business of, of putting other somebody else really down and grinding them while they're down um, is, is um, and, and, you know, the business of people's humor, which was racist or, you know, or diminishing women. Um, I don't think you have to do that. You can still be quite funny. With, you know, you still can can raise a laugh without having to be cruel. But is that not the difference between playfulness? Because I actually think what at, at the centre of it is, you know, you have enough rapport, you have enough connection to be playful. And so you can therefore say things that are a little bit more um, cutting because yeah. you've already got the warmth. And I think that's what the Glaswegian thing is about. I, I, I was, um, the first time I did Top of the Pops, um, and I, you know slightly, and, and we all do this, you puff your chest slightly when you've done something. And uh, I went up to Glasgow to see my cousins in Cran Hill. And uh, I went there and, uh, you know, I'd just been done my first Top of the Pops and I'm on tour and I uh, go and see my cousins in Cranhill and all the wee cousins are there and went, oh, Uncle Paul, Uncle Paul, we saw you on that there Top of the Pops. And just allowed me to puff my chest enough and then went, we thought you were a shite. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> well, you, you know, there is certainly that Scottish thing, which is you must never get to think too well of yourself because they'll bring you back down to the ground. And uh, and uh, I always remember that you know, my sister said that she was in the street with my mother, and somebody had said stop my mother and said, "Oh, I saw something in the papers, Mrs. Kennedy, about your daughter, um, and uh, all the things that she does. I don't know how she does all that." And my mother said, "I know, I know, I know. She's always busy." but you should see her skirting boards. And so basically she may be great in the courts and she may be doing this and that, but all I can tell you is she's not much good as a, house, a housewife. I mean, you know, it's that business of, um, you know, never, never sounding as if you're being too over proud of your own children and never, and never letting your children think that they're too big, you know, they're getting too grand for, they've got to, you know, know, their, know, their, know where they're from. Well, uh, but you talk about children and I, I know you have uh, three children and it, it's uh, 
is that part of um raise is it important to have humor in you were raised with humor is it important to inherently plant that in them so they don't get too big for their boots my boys particularly with each other but also uh, um um, my poor husband is the butt of most of them, <laughs> but I get I get some of it too. And when they're doing it with me, they put on this sort of Scottish accent, this this full Glasgow accent, and they sort of go, "Oh, you know," and uh, 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 "Oh dear," and they 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 take me off, you know. Um, um, but they but their, their father is the person who, who suffers most in their hands. But we but no, there's a lot of laughter in the this house and I think we did get that really from from my side of, of the family of the, the you know that Scottish thing. I think you also have to encourage it and allow it to happen because it brings you back down to earth because you will be in the House of Lords. There's not many places more grand than that. So you have to be rooted when you come home, don't you? When I first took my mother, my mother's dead now, <clears throat> has been for 10 years, and she lived until she was 93. And she was really a rather marvellous woman. She was, and she was very funny. And um, when I first took her to the House of Lords and she looked around and she was saying, I thought half these people were dead. You know, she saw lots of politicians that she, that she remembered from the newspapers and things. And she said, that she, and, uh, but, they, but somebody had stopped her in Glasgow and said to her, how do you feel now, Mrs. Kennedy, about your daughter being a lady? And she said, all my daughters are ladies. Oh! <laughs> But it's that whole thing of just, you know, um, um, I don't make any, any difference bet between them. She, she was, but my mother was a real character. Um, very, very, very funny, funny woman. My mother's uh, 91. She won't thank me for saying that because she's been lying about her age forever, you know. Uh, but uh, but it's that humour as a resilience as well because I mean what they lived through was quite extraordinary. My father was in the army, my mother had uh, two babies while he was away in those six, six years um, I mean when he came home on, on leave she, she, he'd go back and she'd find that she was pregnant and uh, and she had these two babies and she was living in a tenement in Tradeston on the south side of Glasgow which was down on the river and uh, and uh, and it was bombed regularly because, of course, you know it was the shipbuilding area, and uh, and uh, the the tenement that she was in was bombed. And my mother went through the rubble. You know, she had her kids looked after by her mother-in-law for for the after, for the day. She went through the rubble and found things, uh, you know, photographs and stuff like that. And she found pieces of furniture. And somebody had given her a hand cart. And somebody else, the, the, the priest in the local uh, Catholic church, had found some place that she could move into that was about two miles up the road. And she put that stuff on a hand cart like Mother Courage and moved up to find a new place to take her kids. You know, I mean, people went through the most incredible things. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, we, 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 we don't know where a lie, really, that we, we hadn't experienced. But I just now, Paul, I'm, I'm on this task force advising on war crimes in Ukraine. And it's bringing me right up close to those kind of experiences that um, people did talk about, about what happened um, during the Second World War. Yeah, I wasn't born. Um, I, I, I was one of the sort of post-war part of my family. I had two, my two sisters were nine and ten years older than, than me. But um, uh, it was part of our lives hearing those stories um, about, about, uh, about the effects of the war on people. And I think that a lot of men suffered um, uh, terribly by the things that they experienced in the war and then came home and sort of buttoned it up. And I think that, uh, you know, they probably had, were experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder um, and nobody knew. And, uh, and of course, often, you know, drank too much and so on. I'm sure it had, had effects that were never at the time recognized, um, but were seen in, in social problems, you know. I think that's very interesting. We had uh, John Sweeney on the show, uh, uh, the Panorama reporter, and he was he spent uh, well. He's now in Ukraine. He spent the last year in Ukraine reporting from there, and uh, we talked about and you you're talking about the whole thing of dealing with these extraordinarily tragic situations. How important do you think it is to 
be able to see some humour even in the most tragic situations. I've sat in the cells with people who've been looking at life imprisonment and sometimes and, and sometimes got life imprisonment. And and even in those sort of circumstances, people sometimes uh, really uh, the toughest stuff in life. Um, still, still people find a way of laughing at their own vulnerability or laughing at the yeah and and it, it is you know it is the the humor of the of the gallows it's, it is the humor of the morgue um and um you know i just this last week was with um, some very senior people from uh, ukraine and 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 like that you know the only way that you can <clears throat> remind yourself of life and that, and find some enhancement in all of this is to believe in, the, in, in, in how the future might be. And so of course their jokes are all about Putin and what they want to happen to him. And, uh, <clears throat> um, and that's how people survive. Survival is in, is in finding that bit of ourselves that is, um, you know, that has lightness in it and to bring light into dark places. And humor does that. It's an escape as well. I mean, my, I'm I'm the son of a, a Hungarian refugee who um, who was funny enough at 17 put into the war, um, stationed outside Dresden, and then watched what happened there. Then um, joined up with the Russians because they spoke Russian, and went in in uh, 45 to Berlin with the Russians, uh, and then was in prison. But all the time. He used to talk about how lucky he was, you know, because he said we all got a fit of the giggles when we were lined up against the wall in 56 and the Russians shot people next to us. And he said we were laughing uncontrollably because it was the only escape. Yeah, people have to do that. I've just been involved um, uh, uh, last year in the evacuation of a whole of women lawyers and judges um, uh, who were on a kill list for the Taliban and I had to charter airplanes and things to try and get them out because they missed the military evacuation they weren't part of that and I was getting these calls in the middle of the night from women who were in their basements hiding because um, the Taliban were after them because they'd been the judges in cases they'd done or prosecuted them and whatever and they were fabulous women well let me tell you again these were women where uh, <laughs> sometimes women coming together who, who have been through bad things you you'll weep with laughter you know one of one of my women judges said i i when i was leaving and you had told me that we had to we were to get ready and and, and, and you asked us if any of us had burkas um because we should put them on in case we were and be, as we were being transported to the place where the airport was and she said i had banned the burqa from our house because the great thing was that we were no longer after the Taliban were ousted in, you know, early in, you know, in 2002. And she said, and the idea that we were having to phone up relatives and saying, has anybody got a burqa? And, you know, it was, I, I, and, and we were laughing at it because one of, one of my, my women judges, she, 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 as she was leaving the house, she said, uh, uh, and there were gap, I said to them, the, could only have one suitcase. I mean, it's the most terrible thing to be involved in. It was like Schindler's List. And uh, I and I said to, uh, and what she said that she was leaving and then she suddenly thought, they're not going to believe that I'm really a lawyer when, when I get to wherever I'm going. And so she went off and she got all her, her certificates and her diplomas and her degree certificate and stuck it down into her underwear. And she said, one thing I knew was, it was very unlikely that any of the Taliban were going to go putting their hands down into my underwear. I mean, they're, women who found humor in the most awful circumstances um fabulous uh, women and and i'm i mean there they were looking looking death in the face i mean uh, humor is, is something that i think is so it's central to the human condition i couldn't agree more and and it's extraordinary the work you've done but i think you've done that magnificent work partly because you can actually bring a lightness and a humour to it. You've spent your life giving voice to those with the least power uh, within the system and championing civil liberties and promoting human rights. Do you think humanity and humour are closely aligned? I think it's a strand of, of, uh, of our humanness that we, that we, in order to deal with the hard stuff, 
we 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 reach we reach for humor to kind of leaven it. I, I you know I always remember. I mean, and if you can be quick, it it, it, it helps. One of the stories that I always tell was that I I um my life was very affected by a getting to know an amazing American lawyer. He was a great attorney and he was in uh, Britain and he came to the Old Bailey to watch a case and I was acting in a case for a group of anarchists. Now, and my client had been found with a book that was called, and this, and this uh, elderly lawyer was sitting at the back of the court and he watched me doing this thing and then he befriended me and he and his wife became like, a, <clears throat> like family to me. And so it, it did affect my my way of thinking about law and he mentored me well do you know that i when i was doing that case um my client had a book that was called the anarchist cookbook and it was a thing that uh, it was a thing that young people in the uh, you know who were at university in those days had it was a sort of you know it was a bit chic to have this book <laughs> and uh, and uh, and so i said to the police officer in cross-examination i said but look you know it's um this is this this is a coffee table book isn't it really and uh, and, the, and the police officer says, no, I, not that I know. And I said, well, it's kind of, I don't know, you're probably too young to remember this, Paul, but there was an expression at that time, which was radical chic. I said, it was a sort of radical chic thing to have this book. It didn't mean, and the judge said, pass that book up to me. And the judge looks at it. And of course, one page is, you know, how to, how to make mescaline and how to, how to, uh, how to make uh, amphetamine drugs and how to, uh, how to make a Molotov cocktail, a bomb, you know, all that sort of thing. And, uh, and each page had some awful thing on it. And the judge is reading this out how to make a Molotov cocktail. And he says, is this the sort of book that you have on your coffee table to me? And I said, but my Lord, it's a bit like having the Kama Sutra. The fact that you've got it doesn't mean that you do all yeah. the things. Well, can I tell you something? The whole of the jury and everybody laughed their heads off. And, uh, and uh, the judge was furious with me. And, uh, and then I got this note from this elderly lawyer at the back who was visiting and who was at the back of the court saying, I think you're going to win this case. And I have to tell you, I did. <laughs> That's brilliant. What a fabulous story. I mean, I mean, do you really think that, because uh, I, I would guess that it, it's true, and I think you've just given us a story that is true, that humour can sway a jury, or, or humour can bond you with the judge and the jury enough to actually influence a case. There are people who um, are, were great uh, humorists as advocates. There was a man called Gil Gilbert Gray. He was one of the funniest people ever. Great advocate, but so amusing and funny. Great after dinner speaker. Um, and Gilly, um, I, 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 was, I did a couple of cases where, when I was a young lawyer and he was the, the QC in the cases. And he was very, very funny. And there, there's a thing that happens in the bar mace. You know, that's where, where we all have our morning coffee and things. And, and uh, it had that military name. I don't know where, how long it dated. But um, so in the bar mace, um, people used to talk about people. There were the few people who could laugh a, a case out of court. Oh. Now, laughing a case out of court is, is something that very few people could do. Um, but there are some cases where, um, uh, you know, where the, the case is so ridiculous that you can take it to a level where it, the, the jury starts saying, this is ridiculous, um, we're gonna quit because they feel that it's, um, it's been a waste of public time. What's the point of all of this and so on. And I remember there was a, a case where um, involving a dolphin Alvin, it was, it was in one of those sea places. Do you remember? And it was about yes. somebody who was seen in a glass through the glass thing, a cleaner in the aquarium that looked through and saw one of the people who worked in the, in the aqua aquarium at swimming with dolphins. And he was holding onto the dolphins one appendage <laughs> that uh, you could hold onto because they're all slippery on, the, on their bodies. And so if you were to swim with this thing and, uh, and so he was holding onto the, to the um, genital area of this uh, and, the, and the suggestion was that he was doing indecent things with the dolphin. And the guy then so said, it's not, and, if, and he said, I was trained to do things with dolphins in the in the Caribbean or whatever. And it's the only thing that you can hold on to if you're trying to steer it away from, you know, whatever. And uh, and uh, and of course, the jury acquitted him. So I don't care about what happens to dolphins. 
<laughs> the cleaner should have kept her, her, her thoughts to herself and instead of reporting this man to the police. Anyway, but, but it was a colleague who did that case and I always remember weeping with laughter um, about his descriptions of, uh, of how this case went and how this uh, Newcastle jury sort of rolled their eyes to them and thought, is this what we're spending our time in court? You know, an offence against, uh, against dolphins. So there we are. Think that, you know, there are people who can laugh cases out of court. I can't pretend that I'm one of them, but I, but I certainly believe in bringing humour in. I love the phrase laughing a case out of court because, of course, what humour does is it gives you a different perspective. I mean, that's it, you look at it from a different way. And if you can get a jury to look at it from a different way, they can think about it differently. Uh, I, I just find that fascinating. Do you, do you think that you can be a truly great communicator, whether that's as a speaker or whether that's as an advocate, without understanding humour? I mean, there are people um, who are great um, advocates who can... Um, there, there, there are people who are great jury advocates and there are people who are very fine, um, if you like, um, judge advocates. And by that, I mean that the style is different. If you're in the Court of Appeal, <clears throat> you're doing a case um, and it's sheer, purely on the law, and, and I, you know, it's not that often that um, judges on their own, you know, you have three judges up there. And if you're in the Supreme Court, of course, it's a whole bank of judges. Then, um, you know, you're not going to laugh a case out of court in those circumstances. You're there dealing with fine issues of law, fine distinctions. You're, you're, you're making an argument in a very different kind of way. The business of, of being a jury advocate, <clears throat> where you're putting a case in front of um, members of the public and you're trying to you know, deal with a set of facts, but in a legal context, there you've got much more license and it's a different style of advocacy. Now, the, great, the, the really great lawyers are able to do both, and you, but you know how to shift it. You know how to do the, make the difference. And it's, I suppose it's a bit like people who are in the acting profession or in, you know, who at times have to be doing you know, Shakespeare and other times can do you know, like comedy. And I think that uh, uh, you know, the, the, the best um, attorneys and the best advocates are able to do both. Um, um, but there are people who, who, who really are confined to one or the other. And I know great lawyers who as lawyers making legal arguments and distinctions and building up a legal argument are wonderful. But you couldn't get a joke out of them even if you tickled them. You know, I mean, you know, that's not where their skill lies. Isn't humour in, obviously this is a humorology podcast, but isn't humour the difference that makes a difference? It, it's kind of a superpower in one sense, don't you think? I do. I mean, because I mean, even in front of that bank of seven judges, um, there are moments where, where because of the seriousness sometimes of what you're doing, um, laughter becomes um, almost easier. People laugh at things that, are, that normally you wouldn't find that hilarious, but you can, because of the tension um, and the seriousness of the subject matter, um, then relief is found in, in laughter. And so, um, of course you do, you know, where, um, uh, I mean, there's that, it's that business, it happens in the House of Lords as well, you know, where people can get, there are some people who are very good at playing the house, and, and there are other people who are just, just don't have that skill. Um, and, and, you know, it's always kind of, there's, there's always a little bit of excitement when somebody you know is rather a, a performer gets up to their feet because you're sort of anticipating something, something different. Um, but the, one of the things that's said in the House of Lords is, you know, um, everybody has said everything that can possibly be said on this subject, except me. <laughs> and then they're repeating what we've all heard and all the whole set of times. And so there is, the, there is that problem if people want to be on the record as having, you know, um, uh, had their opinion expressed um but there are people i mean one of the funniest things in the house of lords recently was that because of covid um we all had to uh, uh, uh technology had to be suddenly introduced into people's lives who were not particularly technologically skilled and i i mean i do remember at one stage being in a queue for the there's a, a sort of digital help room in the house of lords where you can go and see the these uh 
you know, young techie guys who can help you when you've screwed up your technology. And I was, I was standing in a line behind a very, very elderly peer. And I said to him, uh, I said, are you, are you getting a, a website? Are you here to create a website? And he said to me, Helena, I don't want a website. I want eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I mean, it's, the whole technological thing has been such a challenge to an awful lot of people. But when the house was only operating um, online and basically somebody was sitting on the, the wool sack in the house, empty, and we were all in the little boxes on people's, you know, computers and Zoom, Zoom in. And you'd had to, put, you know, indicate in advance that you wanted to speak. And so you'd be given that there'd be a line up and so on. And so then the speaker in the house would shout out, Lord Gilly McGillicuddy of uh, Upper Montrose. And then some ancient peer would appear in on the screen and he would open his mouth and he would talk and no sound would be coming out of him and he would talk and talk and talk and then the speaker would shout uh, Lord McGillicuddy uh, you're on mute <laughs> and then of course Lord McGillicuddy wouldn't know how to unmute and you'd see him uh, struggling with his, uh, his computer and then some ancient retainer would stroll in who would try and help them with the computer and it, every every presentation would take about 20 minutes and so until we all became sort of technologically um and, and it was very interesting you would see into people's houses you know there were, you would see some very ancient earl a hereditary peer in a castle somewhere and you'd see on the back of his door hanging on a nail would be his dressing gown, you know, <laughs> and he'd be in some ancient bedroom uh, trying to communicate with the House of Lords. Anyway, it was it was a very interesting time, but it's made us all much more technologically equipped. Uh, well, that's it, and the it, it kind of evens the playing field, doesn't it? That that humour of, and that's why I go think about the humour and humanity. It's kind of, it starts from the premise of we're all ridiculous. We know that it's part of the, isn't it part of our, our, how, how we are as humans, that we, that we see the ridiculousness sometimes in, in our behaviours? I think that is the trick, because a lot of people who listen to this podcast are, uh, are listening because they want um, tips and tricks for how to get their lives better. I, I, I get brought in a lot um, as a psychologist to help people with um, speeches and uh, things. And one of the things is that happens a lot is people put other people on pedestals. You know, I can't talk to uh, that Baroness Kennedy because she's uh, way above me rather than seeing them as people. And, and that's where I think the humour and the humanity come together. Yeah, I agree with you, Paul. I think that um, uh, if, if, is, is one of the ways in which you uh, make those connections and you show that you're not you're not any 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 you know you're any different from anybody else you know you may you may have a different job in life but in fact you're affected by all the same things and uh, and 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 you have all the same self doubts and, and all the same sort of con concerns about it you know about our daily round um, but you just try to be the best person you can be. We couldn't fit everything into part one, so in part two, you will get more of her wonderful witticisms, her wonderful insights, and her wonderful charm and repartee. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros, produced by David Rose, music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.